This is going to be a rules video for Rome, Fate of an Empire. This is a, I call it a middleweight Euro game. It's a deck builder, um, engine builder, tableau builder. And there's also resource management, um, hand management, stuff like that going on. And uh, yeah, the goal of the game is to fulfill your edicts, which are specific goals you have to meet, as well as attain a certain number of glory points. And you have to do that inside the allotted time frame, which will depend on your difficulty setting and your um, game length that you choose. And yeah, you can see I have the game partially set up here. So I'll talk you through what I've done already in terms of setup. And, and then we'll do the rest together. So go ahead and find your capital card. This is the first thing I do. And that's this guy right here. You can put your pawn on that right away if you want. This is your leader pawn. So that represents your leader moving around in your empire. Uh, put that capital in, in the middle of the table. Find all of the green backed cards here, uh, or all of the ones that say territory. So there should be 24 of them. Give them a shuffle and then put, deal them out in this five by five grid here with your capital at the center. And then find all of your enemy tokens give them a shuffle and then put them face down on the map here. Now you're going to fill in all of the top row, everything except for that center space in the middle row, and then just the two outside edge spaces for that third row. The rest of these can just hang out somewhere. You, depending on which leader you have, you might end up needing some more of those, but otherwise those will just be set off to the side. I would find your resource track here. So, well, gold and resource here. So you have gold, iron, stone, food, and water. Go ahead and start with three gold. Uh, so this is a card, just grab that card. Then after that, I would go ahead and pick um, your leader right away. There are six leaders to choose from. They each have a card like this. I believe in the physical game, these cards are going to be double-sided. So you'll just have to um, yeah, pick one of them. It doesn't matter because this is a solo game, so you can't play more than one leader at once. So go ahead and grab your leader's card here. And I'm going to set it up right next to my resource track there. Try to make that look nice. Then go ahead and put cubes on all of your bonus tracks. So your your leader's card has five different bonus tracks, culture, military, technology, industry, and population. Just put them on the furthest left starting space there, the one with the grayed out number. A lot of times this is zero, but this will vary depending on which leader you pick. For example, you can see that for Augustus, his population starts at one, and that's fine. You just pick that, put it on that leftmost space. Then I will go ahead and grab your token. So you have three type of, types of tokens here. You've got movement, influence, and trade agreement. Uh, just grab four movement tokens. That's what every leader gets. But then to know how many influence tokens to get, reference the technology track here, and below that track, there's little icons here with numbers showing you how many resource tokens you get based on where you're at on this track. You can see Augustus starts with three, and that's what most leaders start with. But Augustus actually starts with three trade tokens as well. So you can see this culture track here. Below there is the trade token indicator. And most leaders start with two. So I'm going to grab Augustus, his third trade token. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put those on my board over here so they're easier to see. Okay, so we've got those. And then go ahead and grab the two leader attributes. So each leader has two special attribute cards that belong only to them. Uh, and you know which ones are theirs based on this icon. So you can see Augustus's icon here, and he has the two leader cards that also share that icon. Uh, icon. And then over here, I have these sorted a little bit already. These are all of the starting attributes. The reason I have them set out so weird here is 
you're going to actually be taking out two of the cards based on whichever leader you choose. So uh, you can see this one has Augustus's icon with a little X, so we'll take that out. Whoops. And this one also has Augustus's icon with a little X. So we will take that out and we'll take the rest of these and the two special leader icons and you should end up with 16. This is our starting deck. And I'm gonna set that nicely next to my leaderboard there, give it a shuffle. <clears throat> and then let's see, I haven't talked through the rest of the board setup. So this is the market board up here. Um, I would set them out just like this with your turn and round tracker over here. And then the two victory point cards are, um, you just kind of smoosh them together and these will represent your market. Go ahead and put cubes out right away. So put a cube on the first space of the turn track and then put a cube on space one there of the round track indicating we are in round one. The Roman numerals above that uh, have a different meaning. Uh, the numbers actually in the circles here tell you which round you're on. All right, uh, you can see all these cards have common backs, but they're going to be different. They have common backs because each of these could end up in your deck at some point. So find all of your advanced attributes. There should be 32 of them. Uh, we don't have them marked on the card yet, but for the final game, there should be um, some marking probably on one of these upper corners showing you which ones are the advanced attributes rather than the starting attributes. So uh, I would put them face down, give them a shuffle, and then deal out your market of five in these. You can see the spaces here for those. Uh, you will notice that it's a little bit cramped for space here, and that's only because I was lazy when making the TTS mod and I left the bleeds on the cards. So the cards <laughs> will be trimmed down a little bit. And so I promise in the final product, they will fit nicely in those spaces, but we have our market of five here. Then go ahead and find all of your development cards. And they look like this. They have the little house icon with some value in the top left corner. There's gonna be 41 level one developments. You can see the Roman numeral one here and then uh, 18 level two developments. So go ahead and put those in the appropriate space based on that board, give them a shuffle and then deal yourself a market of five level ones to start the game. You will eventually be dipping into that level two development deck, but we're not ready for that yet. And all those can go face up. All right, what else is there to set up? Grab your 10 strife cards and 10 loan cards. You can just put them in a face up stack. They have the common back as well. And then we have our 10 edict cards. And I think I'm ready to go through um, picking your edicts. So that's all of setup, except for we're gonna pick our edicts to start the game, but I have to talk through the two different game modes. So there's um, a short game, which is three rounds, and then a standard game, which it lasts four rounds. Uh, the short game is when you're kind of pressed for time. I can get a short game in in about an hour with setup and teardown. Um, and then the longer game takes about an hour and a half for me. But obviously your mileage will vary. I'm not always the fastest player. So uh, that might be just a poor estimate for some of you once you know the game. Uh, the edicts are double-sided to... Um, accommodate both difficulty level and um, game length. So I won't go through the different difficulty settings, but just know that there's like dials you can um, turn in order to adjust to your desired difficulty level. What I will tell you is for just a normal difficulty game, if you're doing a short game, you're gonna want to get yourself two partial edicts. So the partial edicts are the ones with the uh, hourglass on that bottom right that's empty and then the back side is the full edict version of that same edict and um, these are just like tougher and have a higher glory point requirement so for if you're doing a short game a three round game grab yourself two partial edicts and then if you're doing a standard game which is four rounds grab yourself three 
full edict. So why don't we set up for a standard game? And what I'm going to do is flip all of these to the uh, full edict side, give them a shuffle. And then what you want to do is uh, randomly deal yourself one more edict than you will need. So for the full game, I said, for the standard game, we're going to want three full edicts. So I just dealt myself four, and we will pick three of these. All right. It doesn't really matter, because I'm not going to play this out, but I can't help but try to give myself the best odds at <laughs> winning, even if it's even if I'm not going to play this out. Uh, let's let's pick these three. So these are going to be our our three edicts for the game. Let's have a look at these, shall we? Uh, an edict is going to have a name at the top, and it's going to tell you how many glory points you need to attain at the bottom. So that's the number in the little wreath there. So this 19, 18, and 25. Uh, this on the very bottom left, that's just a reference number. You can ignore that for the purposes of the game. And then the meat of the, the card is in the middle here. And this just has an extra requirement that you need to fulfill. It's basically goals that you need to complete by the end of your game timer. So since we're playing a standard game, we have four rounds to get all of this done. Um, with a normal difficulty standard game, we actually only use the two higher glory point requirements. So I'm going to sort these by that. So since 18 is the lower glory point requirement, we're going to ignore that. And we're just going to need 19 plus 25. And I'm not going to do math on camera. But whatever that total would be, that is how many glory points we would need to have attained by the end of the game. And then we also need to achieve all of this stuff in the middle here. So. This one says build at least five level two developments. That sounds tricky. This one says build four developments without using any cards boosted actions. That doesn't make sense yet, but it will. And then you can track your progress on these with a cube if you would like. Uh, same for these. So many of the edicts require you to build something in multiple stages. Uh, this says build the fountain. What I would need to do is on separate turns, I can't do more than one stage on the same turn. So on separate turns, I would need to spend five water, and then I could cover that up. And then I need to spend six water, I could cover that up, and then eight water on some other turn. And now I've completed this portion of it, and I also need to um, complete both of those. Same goes for building the Roman wall here. And then it also says build all territories along the southern border, which would be those territories down there. OK, so we have our edicts. Uh, yeah, let's explain the game. I've got my rules document pulled up on my other screen so that I don't get too crazy with the order of operations here. I will maybe just explain component anatomies as we go, just so you're not hearing everything, and then you're supposed to have to remember what everything is when we get there. So we'll just do that as we go. And I will explain keywords as we go. So I'm just scrolling past that. OK, gameplay, how do you win? I've gone through that. You have to complete all your edicts by the end of your round timer. And then, uh, OK, we're going to be playing this game in, in turns and rounds. At the end of every turn, the last thing you're going to do is, well, not the last thing you're going to do. But one thing you will do at the end of your turn, you're going to advance the turn marker. And then based on what round it is, when your turn cube hits the um, corresponding space, then um, you've run out of turns. Basically, it's to push the pace a little bit just so you're not lollygagging and uh, not doing enough on every turn. So for instance, oh man, I moved that. For instance, uh, say this is the current state of things. When we're done with this turn and it's round one, when this cube hits the one, uh, as soon as we advance it to that, that's the end of the round. Doesn't matter if we're if we wanted to be done or not. That's the end of the round, and then we would advance the round marker. So same with if it was currently round two, and we advance this into that two space, then uh, that would end the round. It would force force round end. 
Uh, so yeah, what are you doing on a turn? Lots of different options. <laughs> um, the main, well, the only ways to get victory points are to build developments, which are these cards up here, and to uh, defeat enemies. So we'll get to that when we get to that, but just so you know what you're aiming for, um, you will be tracking your glory points on this track up here with that cube. <clears throat> so let's go through a turn, and hopefully some of this will start coming together for you and make a little bit of sense. Uh, there are three phases to a turn. The, f the first and the third phase are actually really simple and just basically upkeep. And the middle phase is the action phase where all, all the stuff happens for the most part. So first phase of every turn is the active projects phase. What you're going to do in the active projects phase is if you have any developments in your projects area, for every development you have, you have to make a choice. You have to either pay one gold, so reduce your gold track by one, or you need to uh, gain one strife. Whenever you gain a strife, that just means take one of these strife cards into your discard. Uh, also, just to make sure I don't forget uh, to tell you, one way to lose is to just not complete your stuff by the end of the game. Another way to lose is um, with collapse. So if you ever take the final card in either the strife or the loan deck um then yeah the game ends and you you lose automatically okay so right if this was the active projects phase i would need to choose to either take one strife or pay one gold since i have a development in my projects area your projects area is the space below your player board here Okay, and then that's the end of the active projects phase. Oh, no, one more piece to that. You also need to then check if you have any active trade agreements. Uh, I will tell you how to get these on later, but <clears throat> you'll notice that some of these territories have these circles here and the handshake icon. That's because there's an opportunity for a trade agreement with this territory. If you have a one of these purple tokens, on either the level one or level two trade agreements, so on either side of here, then you get the benefit uh, of the trade agreement. And I'm realizing that none of the level one trade agreements actually have any effects that carry over more than immediately. So, <laughs> um, well, actually, no, this one does over here. So occasionally that will be the case. So check if you have any active trade agreements, gain the stated benefit, and I'm, I'll talk through those more fully when we get to getting trade agreements. But um, that's what you would do, and then that's the end of the active projects phase. Moving on to the action phase. This is where all the stuff happens. So it's a pretty, pretty open-ended thing. I'll just go through all of the different actions that you can take, and then you're free to, like, take all of the actions that you want to take um, as long as you can still do actions. Most of your actions are going to be card driven, but not necessarily all of them. Uh, so first thing you can do, actually at, at setup, we should have drawn our first hand of cards. You need to abide your hand limit, which is noted by your leader's military track, uh, your military bonus track. So you can see our hand limit is five. As soon as we get here, um, our hand size would be six and so on. I also should tell you that each of the leaders has one or more abilities and they just do what they say. So City of Marble here, for instance, says it costs plus one gold to buy developments. Um, so this is one of Augustus's special rules. Um, usually there's a mix of good and bad abilities. Likewise with um, the special leader cards, usually one is good and one is bad. And they are somewhat thematic to what those leaders actually had to deal with in their day. So I'm going to flip over and reveal my hand here. These are attribute cards. Uh, so one of the actions you can take on your turn is to play attribute cards. And that's a category because there's just like a bunch of ways to play an attribute card. <laughs> um, but let's just let's take a look at one of these. So there's the attributes name on the top, and then there's 
a basic action and a boosted action. So those familiar with Mage Knight will recognize this instantly, and it, it works a lot like Mage Knight, where um, if you play the card, which just means throwing it down on the table somewhere, uh, you automatically get the top action. A lot of times this is just generating one or more of a given attribute, and then other times it's just like other effects and it just does what it says it does. Uh, or based on the card's color, so this is a blue card, if we would spend one water, well, so let's say we had like three water. If we would spend one water, we could use the boosted action. I recommend tilting the, ca the card slightly so you remember which cards you have powered up to use the bottom action. Uh, and then we could generate uh, four culture or four technology. And this top half was um, two culture. Just briefly going into <clears throat> what the attributes are, uh, there's four different attributes in the game. There is, uh, these correspond to your uh, bonus tracks here. So there's culture, military, technology, and industry. And those, you can see those icons for reference here. The main use for generating attributes is to play out development cards. And I will get to that in a minute here. So you can play an attribute for its basic action. And in which case this would have generated us two culture, or you can play it for its boosted action. So let's pretend we did that. And now we can pick either generate four culture or three technology, or you can play it for one of any attribute by playing it face down. Or you can play a card for movement, which means you ignore the effect on the card, but you drop a movement token on it. So I should have had us do this at setup. You don't have to do this, but what I like to do is um, your movement value is determined by your movement bonus as determined by your industry track down here. So you can see the little foot icons, uh, depending on where your cube is on your industry bonus track here, you get a certain level of movement. So we start the game with two movement. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rotate my movement tokens <clears throat> to that two there. And so every time we play a card for movement, we'll drop a movement token on it. You can see you're limited to playing four cards for movement per round. Usually that won't be an issue. And I put my movement token on it. it. Helps me remember that I didn't play this to generate any attributes. And I get two movement. And if I want, as I spend that movement, I can rotate this. It's a little easier to do in person to um, remember how much movement I have left. A lot of times it just goes fast enough. You don't really need to do that. You can just remember and, and spend your movement. Uh, moving. So we played this. We generated two movement. Now I can spend that two movement to move my leader pawn. And movement is orthogonal, so I can move here or here, here or here. You can't move diagonal. That would cost you two movement. So I could go here and then here, and that would be my two movement. You can move into any territory space, any development. Um, even if there's an enemy there, you can move in there to no penalty. Uh, if you move into a space that is adjacent and unrevealed, enemy, go ahead and flip them face up. Now you get to see what is on that enemy token. I will get to uh, conquer actions later, which is how you get rid of enemies. Um, yeah, and you might want to be moving around to these different territories for their different effects, but I will get to those in a minute. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's movement. Uh, okay, you can also play cards to cycle the market. Cycling a card means uh, flipping it face down. So if I were to cycle this one and then putting it to the bottom of its respective deck. So I just cycled that card. Uh, and then, yeah, you wouldn't you wouldn't replace it like that, actually. <laughs> when you fill in the market, uh, we'll, we'll get to this during cleanup. You actually slide it down like you might be used to in a lot of games. And then you fill in from left to right. The main reason for that is there's a graduated cost here. I will I will get to this as well, but one of the actions you can take is buying advanced actions or buying developments, and you can see the graduated cost here. Um, it gets more expensive right to left. But what I was telling you about was you can play attribute cards to cycle market cards. Um, the cycle costs are right here in the center. So you can see it goes from three to one. Oh, 
this is actually, that's a typo. I'm going to have to fix that. Shucks. I'll have to fix that. Uh, I forget what the actual cost is. I think it's 3, 2, 2, 1, 1. Um, so this should be a 2 right here. Uh, yeah. And you can see the industry icon right after those. Uh, remember how I said that most of the time you're going to be generating attributes in order to build developments? Well, another reason you might be generating attributes is to cycle market cards. And so you can spend industry that you generated this turn in order to cycle cards. So uh, let's just say I generated, uh, I played a card, I generated four industry. I could spend some or all of that on cycling cards in the market. And that's top or bottom um, market. So that's advanced attributes or development cards you can cycle. Uh, so let's say I generated four industry. Uh, I could actually cycle three cards from here because you can see this column costs two, this column costs one, this column costs one. So that's four total. Uh, let's say I actually want to cycle that card, but then that card and then that card. So I would flip those over, put them to the bottom, um, the order doesn't really matter. You likely won't get through the deck, so you can pick the order that you want uh, if you cycle more than one at a time. And then you don't actually fill in the market until cleanup, so we wouldn't see new cards until the end of the turn. Uh, okay, that is cycling cards. Okay, that's actually all the ways that you can play attribute cards. So I'm going to take this back into my hand, take a drink of water here. Another action you can take is buying a card. To buy a card, you spend gold, so reduce your gold track by the appropriate amount. And you get to buy, uh, let's pretend this market was full. A little bit cramped over there, okay. The costs are written here, so 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, and 2, 2, 3, 3, 4. Uh, you can see developments are just a little bit more expensive than advanced attributes. Uh, so let's say I spend one gold and I buy this advanced attribute, and let's say I spend another three gold and I buy this development. Okay. When you buy advanced attributes, those uh, you flip over, and you put it to the top of your deck. So you will draw that next hand. Or if you have some card draw effects, you could potentially draw it this turn. When you buy developments, you have a choice of where it goes. You can put it into your hand, in which case it actually takes up a space in your hand. So you don't have to discard down to your hand limit, but um, this would take up a space for like when we're drawing cards for next turn. Uh, so you could put it in your hand. That is a good option if you don't feel like you can build it right away and you don't mind it taking up space in your hand. Uh, or you can put it in your discard, in which case you are basically committing to not seeing it until next round because you'll shuffle up your deck once per round. Um, that might be in the case of, well, I really, really want this development, but I know I'm not going to be able to build it this round. You can put it into your discard. Or the most common is you can put it into your uh, projects area right away. If a development is in your hand, at any time you can just freely put it into your projects area. And the reason you want to put it here is, um, well, you can leave it here, but remember during that active projects phase, there's a penalty for having active projects. Um, more, Most commonly, you're going to put it here and then you're going to build it right away. And so to build a development, we're going to... Uh, Right, we just went through buy a card, now we are on to build a development. I'm just following along in my rule book. You have to look at this top left information here. So this is telling us that we need six technology in, in order to build this development. So I would look through my hand. Okay, I could generate three technology. So I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna play that card for its boosted action. So I'll spend the water to boost that. And then do I have any other technology in my hand? Uh, yeah, I have this one, but I don't have any water left. So let's say I really want it. So I'm going to play three cards face down. 
uh, for one technology each. And so I've generated three, four, five, six. I've got my six technology to develop this farm. What you do then is you <clears throat> rotate it uh, 90 degrees so that it's it's horizontal now. And you put it on top of a territory space that is adjacent to either your capital or to an existing development. So you're going to have to build out um, based on adjacency. And you also can't build on top of a territory that has an enemy. So that's one reason you might want to be clearing enemies is to um, leave room for development. So let's say I want to build it right here. OK, now we have a farm. Uh, let me think. Be aware right away of there's some Here's an example of one. There's some territories that have this, uh, it's a, called a when conquered ability. And that is this icon that's like that um, castle tower that's exploding. And then um, th this name up here of the ability doesn't really matter. What really matters is what type of ability it is and then the effect. So all this means is when you develop it, so when I put, uh, uh, development over top of it, then immediately I would get that benefit, which is gain one gold. So I'd come down here and I would increase my gold track by one. Okay, but we built it here. And now, uh, not that I couldn't move into this space before, but my leader is free to move over here. Um, but immediately after building a development, update two things. So update your glory points. I believe every development yeah, I can't think of an exception. Every development provides some amount of glory points. So that's that one on the top left there. I uh, will just update my track right away. Yay, we're on the board. And then uh, most developments also provide some um, bonus. So these are things that affect your bonus track. So you can see there's the plus and then the technology icon. Uh, I would come down here and immediately update my technology bonus track. And then if I had moved into a space that reached one of these next icon levels, um, I would immediately, if it's one of these three here, I would immediately, um, well, if it's one of these two, you get a token. So if I moved into here, now I get four influence tokens instead of three. So I would go to the general supply. I would grab myself an additional influence token. And then if I had moved into a new space for a, another trade token, I would do the same thing. I would grab a trade token from the general supply, add it to my personal supply. Uh, if you move into a new <clears throat> um, foot icon here, the move icon, that is that just tells you how much movement you get for every card you play for movement. So I would just remind myself of this by rotating my whole stack of movement tokens. Now, every time I play a card for movement, it would get me three movement instead of two. And then we talked about the military track. If I move into a higher hand size, uh, nothing happens right away. But next turn, when I refresh my hand, I would get to have a higher hand size. You will have some developments that increase your population. This has, you don't, there's no unlocks with this um, directly, but there are a decent number of cards and developments in the game that key off of your population. The biggest thing with population is one of the actions at your capital, but I will get to that when I talk about um, development actions. Okay, so we just got through uh, building a development, just scrolling ahead here. <clears throat> so let's get into leader actions. Leader actions typically involve your leader pawn. Uh, one of the most important actions in the game is influencing, and it's really easy. You just get to drop an influence token on a development at which your leader currently is. Now, you, you can't drop on territories. There'd be no reason to anyway. Uh, only your capital and developments that you've already built. So uh, let's say I play a card to move to. Um, before I move, I could drop an influence token here, and then I would move over here, and then I would just drop an influence token there. So these influence tokens are, are a way to sort of um, run your engine, essentially. 
from influence tokens, you get to um, exhaust them, which is flip them over to the exhausted side, and then choose one of the actions on the development to go ahead and do. I will go through those in detail. Um, that's the most involved part of the game, so I will go through that in a minute here. But just for now, know that um, if your leader is on <clears throat> a development that does not already have an influence token, um, ready or exhausted, doesn't matter. Like, I couldn't drop one here because I already have an exhausted one here. Uh, then if, if you meet those criteria, uh, there's not already one there, ready or exhausted, uh, and there's not an enemy there, and it's not a territory, it's a development or your capital, then you can go ahead and drop an influence token there. Okay, the other thing, um, the other leader action is making trade agreements. So, can't remember if I covered this at all yet, but these territories that have the, uh, the ones with this handshake icon in the middle and like this X and then some amount of technology on, on the sides, if you move into a space, <clears throat> a territory that has a trade agreement option, which is, it looks like this, then you have the option of generating the appropriate amount of technology and um, creating a trade agreement. So let's just say I played cards from my hand and I was able to um, generate four technology. I could, if I wanted to, create that level one trade agreement. Um, so there's a level one on the left and a level two on the right. Level one is a little bit weaker. Level two is a little stronger. Usually the level two is like recurring revenue. Uh, but let's pretend we did the level one trade agreement. So I spent my four technology. I'm going to drop a trade agreement token there. And then I just do what it says. So it says gain a stone now. Uh, actually gain two stone now and end this agreement. So I would come down here and I would gain my two stone. Yay. And then... It says immediately end this agreement. So I'm going to flip this token over to the uh, waning side, and then I'm going to uh, move it to the center. Tokens on the center mean the agreement is uh, now ended. Uh, but let's pretend instead that I had played, I had generated um, seven technology, because that's this cost over here. Then I would put the token here, and I would do what it says. And so it says gain. Um, one stone per turn. So I actually get that right away. So I would gain my one stone and then at the start of every other turn, so in that active projects phase, then I would get that recurring revenue of building up stone. At the end of this round, so trade, ag trade agreements last two rounds. So they last the round that you're on and then they last one additional round. So uh, say it's round one right now, uh, we finish out the round at the start of round two as part of round cleanup. We're going to flip this over. This doesn't mean the agreement is ended. When the when the token's in the middle, it means it is ended. But it's still active. It's just waning. Um, so we still get this benefit for one more round. We just flip it as a reminder that, okay, we're on round two of two of having this um, agreement active. And then at the start of round three, we would um, move it to the center, and it has ended. You have a limited number of trade agreement tokens. so you can't just make them on every single territory, but they can be a good way, especially early, of getting that recurring resource revenue. Uh, one way to get, I think the only way to get these tokens back is if you build, so you can freely build over territories that have um, either active or ended trade agreements. And then if you build over it, you get to flip that and you get that back into your supply. So you could potentially make an agreement somewhere else. Okay, those are trade agreements. Now let's get into development actions. Uh, we'll just look at a few examples. So you don't have to be, your leader doesn't have to be on the space. Um, all you need is, um, hmm. let me start over. Development actions are of a number of different types. Almost all developments have a, um, a production section over here. So you can see the one food icon there. That means I could exhaust this token and um, I could exhaust it for its production action, which would get me one food. So I would exhaust it, come down here and I would get that one food. Okay. Um, or 
there might be these asterisk icons. Those are when spent actions. And so the name doesn't really matter. It's, it's the icon that matters. It tells you the type. And then you just do what it says over here. So I could flip this token, exhaust it, and then it says gain gold equal to the number of farms adjacent to this one with a ready influence token. Well, that would be silly of me to do that uh, because there's no farms adjacent to this one. But um, let's look at one of these other ones here. Uh, yeah, the fountain. If I would flip that and spend it on this my, uh, muse, asterisk, or when spent action, it would be minus two to the gold cost of buying an advanced attribute to a minimum of one. So a lot of variety in those when spent actions. One of the, um, well, some of the uh, three of the most significant actions you can take in the game are actually right here at your tap at your capital so this first one i could flip this and i could take the tax action that says gain one strife then gain one gold for every one population so first i would gain strife which means putting it into my discard and then i would gain one gold per my population my population right now is one so i would gain one gold if i had had three population i would gain three gold Or I could take the borrow action here, gain up to two loans, gain two gold for each. So that would be, let's say I want to take two loans, that would get me four gold, which would take me all the way up to eight gold. Uh, or I could exhaust this to take a festival action, which is pay one gold to trash <clears throat> um, strife equal to your culture rating or your culture bonus you can only strafe try strife you can only trash strife that's in your hand currently uh, unless the effect says otherwise uh, you can only trash cards that are in your hand there'll be other effects that let you trash cards so unless it tells you otherwise you can only trash it if it's in your hand um, we haven't talked through this but all you got to do is read the card to see how strife and loans are bad for you. So at the end of the game, every strife card in your deck is minus two uh, glory points. One way to get rid of strife is that uh, festival action we talked about. Another way to get rid of strife is what it says on the card. You can just generate and spend four culture to return this card. Returning strife and loans means just putting it back in the stack. Uh, if you trash a card, that means put the card up here in the trash area so like this would be a trash card one important um, rule is if you're trashing strife or loans specifically you actually have to um, tr so like let's say I had this strife in my hand and I uh, I took an action that allowed me to trash one strife whenever you trash strife or loans Yes, I would trash that card, but you also have to trash an additional one from the pile. The reason that exists is so that, because um, trashing is a pretty powerful action, uh, that kind of disincentivizes you to overuse that because now look, I only have seven strife left in my stack. And if you recall, uh, if I ever take the last card from this pile, then the game ends in collapse. So you can um, you can fly a little too close to the sun sometimes by trashing um, loans and strife. Uh, loan cards, that just reminds you, you get two gold when you take a loan. Um, but if this card is in your hand, you can pay three gold to return it. Returning it again is better than trashing it because it um, just returns it to the stack. And if it's in your deck during scoring, it is minus three glory points. Okay, those are when spent actions. The one with the lightning bolt is a when influence action. So that occurs when you, let's say it was like this, when you drop the influence token, that's your opportunity to carry out the um, the when influenced action. So this says spend two industry to gain one gold. So I could, I could play cards from my hand uh, to generate two industry, or sorry, gain one gold, gain one, to gain the one food token or resource here. Okay, 
Uh, what are the other type of development actions? Let me see if I can find some of the different types. Yeah, there's one right here. So this one has a while influence actions. These actually get pretty important. So the ones with the little uh, kind of Caesar's face icon here. Uh, this is active as long as there's a ready influence token on it. You can do what the action says. So this says up to twice per turn pay to iron for one gold. Uh, I haven't mentioned this yet, and I probably should have mentioned it sooner. Actually, no, that's coming later in the rulebook, but I can mention it now. Uh, one action you can take is an exchange action, and that is you can trade four gold for, or I'm sorry, I did that backwards. You can trade four of any resource. So let's say I had uh, six stone. I can spend four stone to trade that for one gold. So that's the conversion rate. And you'll find that many of your developments give you advantages on that natural conversion rate. So this says up to twice per turn, pay two iron for one gold, uh, which is better than paying four iron for one gold. So I might want to leave one of my influence tokens on here in order to take advantage of that. Now you could, uh, like I could, do the while influenced action and then on the same turn I could exhaust it and then do the when spent action or I could do the production action. Okay, resting leader actions. The, those are the ones with the boot. Uh, if there's no enemy here and my leader is on the territory, I think only territories have this. There might be one or two other uh, there might be one or two developments that actually have a resting leader action, but mostly it's territories, and uh, this one says trash one strife. So resting leader actions, you resolve those um, at the end of your turn during cleanup. So I would have to leave my leader pawn here, and then I could trash one strife that was in my hand. Okay. Uh, ongoing development actions, I'm going to have to find one. It has the infinity symbol. And usually it's just like a rule that you have to abide. So this one here says amenities. That's just the name of the, um, of the action. Uh, and it's an ongoing action, which is the infinity symbol there. Domus must be adjacent to a development that produces food or water. So remember, production is over here. Uh, the language of the game is provide over here. So like this one provides two population bonus, uh, but it produces one stone. Okay, and those ongoing um, actions are just always in play. And we already talked about the when developed type of development action. Okay, conquer actions. This is where you can defeat these enemy tokens. Uh, for a conquer action, unless it states otherwise, unless you have some effect that breaks this rule, uh, you have to be in the same space as the enemy token. Um, you can freely move through these spaces. Um, you just can't benefit from the development, so like, uh, or from the territory, if there's an enemy token on it. Uh, these are actually pretty simple. The, <laughs> it's a lengthy explanation in the rules, but it's actually pretty simple. You play military, so this is one of the alternate uses for generating military attribute. Uh, you play military, and uh, your goal is to at least get to that top left, that shield value there. Uh, that's the, I think it's called the defense value. I have to get to four military in order to defeat this token, is what that four tells me in blue there. Uh, ideally, you want to also play enough military to reach that the total of the top left and top right, because that top right is the um, enemy's attack value. And you negate that attack value by just playing additional military over and above the defense. So uh, if I played four military, I would um, defeat the token but I would take one damage because it has one attack that I didn't um, essentially block. Uh, or this one might be an even easier example. If I played two military, 
I defeat the token because I met its shield value, but um, I did nothing to block that attack, so I would end up taking four damage. How you take damage is you have to take strife. So for every unblocked damage, I would take one strife card into my discard. So like with this one here, if I just played my two military, that's four unblocked attack, and that means I would take four strife. Um, let's say instead I had played four military, so I met that top left value, the defense, and then I blocked two of the attack. So I would just take the net uh, above that, which would be two, or the difference, and so I would take two strife instead of the full four. But let's say I had played six military, then I would have um, not only defeated the, the token, but also blocked all of its attack, and um, I wouldn't take any strife. Okay, uh, what you get when you defeat the token is immediately I get the glory point reward, which is on the bottom left, so I would give myself one glory point and adjust that track. And then on the bottom right, um, I would get that amount of gold right away, so I'll get two gold. And then I get to take that token off the board and keep it over here just for reference, but I would get my gold. And another benefit, um, my, yeah, my leader would have had to been there. Another benefit is now this territory is free. So now I could build developments over top of it, or I could do this trade agreement. Uh, and since my leader is there, remember you get to reveal um, enemy tokens that are adjacent to your leader. Okay, those are conquer actions. Uh, another action you can do during your turn is return or trash strife. Uh, we went through that already. Um, just the text written on the card or certain development actions, specifically some of the actions on your capital. Uh, same for loans. And then we talked about the exchange, any same type resource. So that's some language that the game uses is uh, same type or different type. Um, so two same type resources would be two stone or two uh, food. Two different type resources could be like one iron and one food. Um, so the game will use that in some of its effects from time to time. But four same type resources you can exchange for one gold. And you can do that at any time. Uh, worth noting that this does not count as gaining gold. The game will use certain effects uh, that, that talk about when you gain gold, you know, gain this or that benefit. Uh, exchanging is not the same as gaining. Okay, we're getting close. Uh, those are all the actions you can take. So then when you're done doing actions, you can actually end your turn at any time. Uh, you could theoretically do nothing on your turn. Um, but when you're done taking actions, or you decide you're done, and uh, or you just literally have nothing else that you can do, uh, go ahead and do the cleanup phase. So this is, I have a, a few steps uh, written down here. First, resolve any resting leader actions. We talked through those. Then remove any spent influence uh, tokens from your empire. Uh, these are ready influence tokens, and this is spent. And now that one is spent um, or exhausted. I feel like I use that interchangeably sometimes. Um, so either one, spent or, or exhausted uh, influence tokens. So at the end of your turn during cleanup, if it was exhausted, it comes off the board, it gets readied, and it goes back into your personal supply. Okay. Uh, discard any cards you played during this turn. So that includes cards you played for any reason. Played it face down, um, played it to generate an attribute, or even played it for movement. You would return that movement token and then go ahead and put all those cards into your discard. I don't know why I have two discard piles going there. Uh, so yeah, you just have the one discard pile. Uh, you don't have to discard your whole hand. So if you're coming from other deck builders, you might be used to just playing your whole hand and discarding it. You don't have to play your whole hand uh, and you don't have to discard any cards remaining in your hand. You can if you want. Um, so you can optionally discard cards at, at this point. Um, typically you don't want. <laughs> typically you want to play cards pretty conservatively or, or make sure you're getting the most out of every card play. Uh, then draw your next hand. So. I'm going to fill my hand size to my military bonus, which, um, I mean, I would have earned this at some point by playing developments, but 
uh, my hand size would be six, so I'm going to draw to fill my hand to six. That's four, five, six. And if you remember, we had purchased uh, this advanced attribute uh, last turn, so now we get it in our hands. The rest of these are starting attributes. Hey, everybody. You may be noticing a little bit of a glitch in the matrix here, and that's because uh, in my original version that I cut here, uh, my audio cut out near the end. So the last 10 minutes or so were um, just, yeah, you couldn't understand what I was saying. So uh, I am going to pick up where I left off here. Sorry for that little bit of a glitch. Uh, let's get into it then. So we were just working on replenishing the market. We had just filled our hand and I'll show you how to um, replenish the market at the end of your turn during the cleanup phase here. So we're gonna move everything down as far as it can fill to the right, and then we will fill from the appropriate deck. And I believe I talked through the rules already for when uh, you unlock the ability to deal from the level two development deck. Um, so that is our market filled. We had no spaces up here. And so uh, that would be the end of the turn uh, filling the market, and we already filled our hand, so all that's left is we would advance the turn marker one space. And you can see, um, well, so actually, that's the end of the turn. So if you were playing a normal game, you would just jump into the next um, turn, and then I will just tell you how it works when you hit end of round. So end of round is triggered in one of two ways, either since we're here, let's look at the turn tracker. Either the turn track hit the appropriate number here. So if you're in round one, when it hits this space, uh, that's immediately round end. So like if we were here and the turn ended and we had to advance the turn marker and it hit that number one there, that means the round ends immediately. You don't get to play another one. Uh, likewise with, you know, if we were in round two, so you, you get a little bit of extra time as you progress in rounds. Uh, so that's one way that the round can end, and that happens immediately when that happens. Uh, the other way is if your deck was empty at the start of your turn, and you have no more valid actions you can or want to make, that also triggers round end. So what do you do at round end? Uh, there's three steps. Shuffle your discard pile to become your deck for the next round. If you happen to have extra cards in your deck, just shuffle those up too. So we'll go ahead and do that. Now our deck is ready for next round. You advance the round marker one space and also reset the turn marker back to the star. And then you cycle all cards in both markets. So I'm just going to stack those up, cycle those to the bottom. And then we would replenish the market for the next round. So I won't go through that work, but you would, you know, deal out the cards actually from right to left and so on. Uh, okay, so you do that until you hit the end of the final round that you're playing. And again, that's going to depend on how long of a game you were playing. If you're playing a short game, uh, that's at the end of round three. So that's what that would look like. And if you're playing a standard game, that's at the end of round four. Okay, so at the end of the game, it's time to tally up your points and subtract any points from uh, bad cards in your deck, so strife and loans. So we would have been tracking the points that we were getting on this track here. Uh, and then let's just say we were here. Uh, and then we would look through our deck and I would usually just sort them and then you find however many strife and loan cards you have in your deck you subtract that many points and it's written right on the card you get minus two points for every strife card and minus three points for every loan card so I would just go here and I would reduce my score by whatever that amount would happen to be uh, then you go ahead and see if you fulfilled all your edicts, including your obligation of glory points. So you need to um, have finished all of the written requirements here. So we would have had to 
develop all territories along the southern border. And we talked through all these. We would have had to gone through these stages of building that Roman wall, uh, building the fountain, building developments without using boosted actions. It's kind of a tricky one. And then um, having at least five level two developments out there. So we have to complete all three of those in addition to on the normal setting. Um, so on the normal difficulty setting in a standard four round game, we grab the two higher glory point cards and we total that up um, in terms of your, your glory point requirement. So we can ignore this 18, but we have to meet this 19 plus 25, which would be what, 44? And so we would go up here and we would see, okay, is our net glory point score at least 44? And if it was, and if we had met all of our other edict requirements, then we'd win the game. But if any one of those things is not completed by the time you hit round end on your final round, then you lose the game. So cool. Yeah, like I said, I didn't have that much left. It's unfortunate that my audio cut out, so hopefully that wasn't too jarring for you guys. But uh, yeah, I also apologize. This is a long video. Um, I, I wanted to make sure that you had all the rules. So if this is what you were learning from, I wanted to make sure everything was clear so you had all the rules. So um, thank you for getting through it, and I hope you guys uh, enjoy the game.